Dr. Anthony Fauci of the Coronavirus Task Force is sounding at least a little more optimistic about the months ahead, telling CBS this morning we might be able to return to somewhat normal life this summer, at least for a period of time. It can be in the cards, and, and I say that with some caution, because as I said, when we do that, when we pull back and try to open up the country, we have to be prepared that when the infections start to rear their heads again, that we have in place a very aggressive and effective way to identify, isolate, contact, trace, and make sure we don't have those spikes that we've seen now. Fauci said the levels of normalcy will vary regions by region, but before we look too far in the future, there's still the present threat. Just about all the predictive models say peak hospitalizations and deaths in Massachusetts are still several days away. And while Governor Charlie Baker said today that the state is taking a number of actions to get ready for that, he warned that everyone needs to stay vigilant. We built most of our models off the experience that other countries uh, and other regions have had in other parts of the world. But again, they're just a model. I don't have a crystal ball with respect to how long it's going to last or how high it's going to go. I will be incredibly careful about not permitting this insidious, awful, and horribly dangerous and contagious virus from coming back anytime soon. The reason we're doing this is to keep people alive. But despite warnings like those, if you go out, you're bound to see a very wide variety of behaviors and, frankly, strange happenings, which can be unsettling. At the largely empty parking lot at the shops at Chestnut Hill, there's a makeshift COVID-19 testing tent set up for Newton first responders and a few other people. It's only open Monday, Wednesday and Friday, but neighbors were alerted just to let them know what's happening and not to be alarmed. Downtown, even in the rain, there were several dog walkers and strollers out on the Commonwealth Avenue Mall, many wearing masks. And while bikers weren't out today, runners and walkers were cruising along the Esplanade. Over at the intersection of Mass Avenue and Melnia Cass, there was no social distancing at all. This is a place where drugs are sold and users and homeless people hang out. It was an area targeted by a controversial Boston police sweep last summer, but people are back. I'm joined now by Sandro Galea, the dean of Boston University School of Public Health and the co-author of the forthcoming book, Pained, Uncomfortable Conversations about the Public's Health. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Galea. We all become very focused on the statistics, and I don't know about you, but I rush to the papers or those great websites now that give you the arcs and the numbers, and whenever I see the curve flattening or one of the numbers going down or a predictive measure leveling off, I feel relief. Is, is that ridiculous? No, I don't think it's ridiculous. First of all, thank you for having this conversation. I, um, this is unprecedented. I think it's reasonable for all of us to give ourselves a break a little bit, meaning that uh, it's okay to be anxious. It's okay to be worried about this. I mean, we are hearing about this all the time. And we've never had an experience like this in your life or in my life where all of us are worried about the same thing. So I think this is a scary moment. And I agree with the governor, you showed the clip earlier, that uh, this is a terrible disease for those who get it. So I think our caution, our being afraid of it is reasonable. We're talking about April 18th being the peak in Massachusetts anyway. And a week or 10 days ago, the prediction for the number of deaths in Massachusetts was in the 300 and something figure. They've now reduced that figure to about 213. First of all, how do they know? How can they measure that? And is that a good sign that things are leveling off? It is a good sign. And I would caution what the governor said as well. The governor was very clear. He said, these are models and these are projections. And the way we know is by measuring how the virus is spreading. We have other viruses, other diseases, and we learn from them. And we also look at other countries. So from other countries, we know what the shape of the epidemic looks like. That means how fast it's spreading. And as a result of how fast it's spreading, what might happen tomorrow and next week. So is that good news? Yes, it's cautious good news. And the projections are that in the next seven days, we'll see the peak. Now, the bad news about that means that the next seven days will be the worst seven days. That's when we're going to see most cases, when we're going to see most people who are severely affected. The good news is that past that, we should be entering a period of relative slowing. The State Department of Public Health today for the first time said they're going to start breaking down the deaths by ethnicity, race, sex, everything. 
Why hasn't that been done before when all that data is readily available on death certificates? Right now, only about a third of the people who have died from this virus have been recorded according to their their ethnicity. Why? Why wasn't that just automatic? Yeah, I actually don't know. I, I, I can't comment as to why it hasn't been done. I'm sure there are reasons for it. But the data that we're seeing is um, very helpful. It actually shows no particular disparity yet in terms of race, ethnicity mm -hmm. in Massachusetts, which is different than what we've seen in other states. And, and I would expect that to change. And, and I would applaud the state for making these data available at this point. I think we need to be very conscious of the fact that people who are vulnerable already are the ones who are more vulnerable to the virus. That is exactly what has happened in other places. That's what we expect to happen here, which is, of course, why I think we have a responsibility collectively to make sure that we do everything we can to help those who are already marginalized. But have we? I mean, you saw we mm -hmm. showed a few pictures of the corner of Massachusetts Avenue and Melnia Cass. There's a very large gathering of people there, many of them using drugs, buying drugs, making deals. We really don't know what. But they're shoulder to shoulder. Some of them are lying there. I mean, how do we get the message out to vulnerable groups like that? Well, I think we have to be careful about um, putting the onus on the vulnerable group. I, I, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's just. I think ultimately it's on us as a society to structure opportunities. So there have been some things that have been positive happening. For example, the governor just announced and that uh, we're going to be using beds from universities and from hotels to create places for the homeless to go to. But if you're homeless at this point in time, you are extraordinarily vulnerable. And we should not be in a position of saying to someone who's homeless, find someplace else. It's on us to create those opportunities for the homeless. Well, that's interesting because, as you know, there was a big police sweep in that area and they rounded up a lot of people. But could they do that? It would be a total violation of people's civil rights if they rounded them up and brought them to beds and put them places? Yeah, I actually don't know exactly what they did, so I won't comment on that specifically. But I do, I do know that uh, we often make a mistake together where we say, and we look at people who are homeless or people who are uh, unstably employed and, and we put the onus on them. And, and that is simply not how we should operate. We as a state, as a commonwealth, have a responsibility to create the beds and create the opportunities so that everybody can be safe from a pandemic like this. And we are doing some of that. We are actually heading in the right direction. Dr. Anthony Fauci said today that maybe by summer we'll see a return to some normalcy. One of the big questions that everybody has is about how these uh, droplets, globules that are really made of fat, survive in heat. Will they f sink to the ground faster? Will they melt faster? Is the, do we know how heat will react with this virus? That's an excellent question. The, the short answer is we do not know. The longer answer is we know from other coronaviruses that they are responsive to heat in some respects. But really, the, the, the question remains an open question. And, and I do think that uh, what Dr. Fauci said is roughly right, that uh, given the epidemic curve, given what we know about other coronaviruses, we, we, with, with some luck and things coming the right way, we should be returning to some semblance of normalcy by some. But he also warns that we could be in for a second wave of this, maybe in the fall, maybe even a year from now. I mean, people are going to be really hard pressed, I think, to go back to anything that really looks like normal this summer. Yeah, I, I, um, I think what Dr. Fauci said was that we may be entering this where this becomes seasonal, where, where coronavirus becomes something that comes every season. Um, and, and, and I think that's reasonable. But let's not forget that one of the challenges that we've had right now is that we've had a really poor and poorly coordinated federal response. We haven't had enough tests. Once we have enough tests, we will be able to implement a system or near universal testing, a system where we do symptom screening. And for those who get symptoms who we know have never been positive, we can do rapid contact tracing, find the people they've been in contact with, and then uh, introduce isolation for people who are then at high risk. If we did that, we can, we can avoid these really large scale blunt measures that we've taken as a society that have really shut society down. So I, my hope is that as we develop the technology, the testing, as we get better at the symptom screening, case identification, contact tracing, we will be able to, as a society, continue operating while also being prepared to protect ourselves from this. You're always a comforting voice, I have to say. Sandro Galea, thank you for joining thank us. You. Thank you very much.